this video we're going to look at the stupid things that novice investors do and the things that we're going to look at are um, things that simply do not work but yet are repeated endlessly by investors you often hear about people talking about these strategies and they're just pure nonsense we'll start by looking at dividend capture this is the idea that you can buy a stock before the dividend then sell it immediately after the dividend hence pocketing the value of the dividend without really owning this, the stock just having it for a couple of weeks pocketing the dividend dumping it sounds like a great idea free dividends picking up just hundred dollar bills that are lying around the stock market for anybody to come along and pick up sad reality is it doesn't really work very occasionally it works people have found examples people have uh, made money doing it once or twice but it requires luck it's not a consistent pattern if this happened all the time the market would have to be unbelievably inefficient which is not the reality also people try and apply it to fixed income so buying a bond before the coupon selling it after uh, which is really really bad idea uh, these things work very efficiently regarding um, income payments so you're not going to make money doing that because the income accrues over time and everybody knows that it's accruing that they talk about the clean price and the dirty price of a bond so you're not going to make money try to capture those dividends and a lot of people like to ignore taxes and commissions that you pay on investing but when you the dividend capture effect is generally quite small uh, even if you get away with it but when you take in taxes and commissions it's really not worthwhile even when it does work ignoring market efficiency which is exactly what those dividend capture people do the reality is the markets are efficient to some degree I don't know how efficient they are um, but there is some degree of efficiency if there's new news that comes into the market people are adjusting to it and most of the money so hence most of the ability to move prices is handled by professionals these are people that could read balance sheets they can analyze them and they can uh, debate essentially among each other by buying and selling to get prices to a reasonable level it's not perfect but it's not completely off uh, you have to be able to go against them and be right to make a lot of money which is very difficult and the vast majority of investors couldn't do that if they tried uh, new information is very quickly reflected in prices if you read a news story about something and you look at the stock price it's moved before you've uh, done that unless you're up at four o'clock in the morning and the market isn't even open yet but when it does open that news will be uh, moving that stock in whatever direction but people are still insist on overreacting to news as I said prices adjust very quickly um, people like hedge fund managers um, traders in London these people have been up for hours studying all of this and you've not even got out of bed when these people have been analyzing the news and it's not just anyone analyzing it these are people they call analysts for example if a pharmaceutical company like Glaxo puts out news there is someone in London whose basic job is to analyze pharmaceutical companies and they will know absolutely everything there is to know about Glaxo they will have spent hundreds of hours looking into the business so they will be able to decide the effect of the news far better and far faster than you can so if you hear something on the news and you immediately call your broker to uh, sell it or uh, buy more of it because of the news it's already just in the price and as uh, Robert Schiller says your broker will just laugh at you you're not doing yourself any favors by overreacting to news buying high and selling low sounds completely ridiculous but it is the most common mistake happens all the time the best example is the dot-com bubble um, the big dilemma in investing is that the best time to buy stocks is when no one wants them and uh, obviously most people are not buying stocks when most people don't want them there's a contradiction there and one of the reasons 
is that it is far easier psychologically to go with the herd. Now, can you imagine when you're hearing all of the bad news about the banks and the financial crash and you're saying to your friends as they're plummeting that you're putting all your money in banking stocks? They would have laughed at you. You made an absolute fortune if you'd done it right. But it would have been so stressful to know that everybody thinks you're wrong, everybody's dumping their banking stocks, yet you're buying them up aggressively. Not easy to do. Performance chasing, um, probably after uh, the buying high and selling low, this is the most common, though they are related. Because the best performing funds are often last time's worst performers because they trade at such big discounts. So you can get them performing well and the discount narrowing, which can be extremely lucrative. But yet, it's far nicer to see a fund that's performed very well recently and then buy more of it because you feel kind of vindicated by its past performance. Uh, but the sad thing is some managers are just right once in a row. And of course, when you see great performance last year, you assume that's exactly what's going to happen this year. The reality is, past returns are a very bad predictor of what happens in the future. Because a fund made 20% last year doesn't mean it's going to make 20% this year. That All that past performance says to you is you should have bought that fund last year, which is very nice to know, but not particularly useful. Because you can't go back in time and buy all the right funds. And another overlooked thing is when managers do well and people spot this manager and go, they're good, they give them a lot more money to manage. And the more money that someone manages, the harder and harder it is to outperform because the fewer and fewer stocks you can take meaningful positions in. The classic example is uh, Peter Lynch of uh, the Fidelity Magellan Fund. He did very, very, very well when managing small amounts of money, but as the... Um, about money and his fund got bigger and bigger into the billions became far more difficult and his performance suffered. Not because there was anything wrong with him but because he had way too much money. Uh, active trading, when people start in the market they keep thinking that stocks are something to be bought and sold with great frequency that the way to make money in the market is as a trader which is totally wrong. The best strategy in my opinion is a buy and hold just buy good companies, keep a hold of them, or buy broad index funds uh, far better than trading because you're spending so much money. You make your broker very rich when you actively trade, which is not the point. That's You're not trying to make someone else rich. You're trying to make yourself. Uh, market efficiency, that's something that a lot of very active traders or new just assume doesn't exist. They think that they can predict the movements of prices. Not a good way to think. Um, when you're a trader you have to be right consistently. If you're right a few times and wrong spectacularly it's going to really hurt you. You're very vulnerable to random events. And since you're not holding on to stocks very long you don't have dividends to reassure you. You've not got a nice income stream. So if you're in a company with a really good competitive position with a very recognizable product that is just going to sell over the, the future, it's going to be fine. Then you know that even if the stock price goes down, you can buy more of it and you're still getting that income. So you're far more relaxed about it. When you're an active trader, you don't have that. And another thing active traders often do is they try and spot patterns. They use people chartists, which I don't believe in this at all. I find that these chart reading works until it doesn't, which is not a very helpful way to invest. There's, I haven't seen any empirical evidence support the theories. And if there was empirical evidence, people proved that all of these patterns work and all of these patterns exist, it would probably destroy itself. It would undo itself because there'd be so much more buying pressure when there was some pattern. And you ought to look into the idea of random walk. Uh, if you randomly plot stock prices with an uptrend and you do it enough, you get very close to what the market actually does. There's a very good uh, lecture Robert Schiller does on this uh, Yale courses. Where it's very important to consider value traps, which is where uh, a stock is very cheap, but it's cheap for a reason. 
Uh, not all cheap stocks are good investments. Just because you you look on Morningstar and you see a stock trading at a PE of five, doesn't mean it's a great company, uh, and doesn't mean it's going to be a very good investment. Often PE stocks do out low PE stocks do outperform, but they don't always. Sometimes it's just a crap company. It's not a good investment. So they're cheap for a reason. Often they have way too much debt. A good example would be recently First Group. Very good business. Um, they run about half of all of the school buses in America. That's quite a good competitive position. But yeah, it's got about $2 billion in debt. They've just done a rights issue, so it's probably slightly less than that now. Um, but $2 billion in debt, that's extremely expensive to service. And although it is very cheap, that debt's going to be a big problem. Um, eroding market share, other competitors coming in and taking their business, and maybe the uh, the other competitors have less debt and are more able to move around or have some other advantage over it. So your company is actually not going to be growing. It's going to be getting smaller and smaller as its competitors grow. So that's why it's cheap. It has to be cheap to so you can get a return even though its market's being taken away from it and poor long-term economics if you look at it and you go in 50 years this is not going to exist or this is just declining then you would think that it would have to be quite cheap in order to justify buying it um, Often people look at a slightly different note. People look at steel companies and go, don't these look really cheap? But people don't really believe that their earnings are going to continue at that level. Steel is extremely volatile. So you can see them trading at four or five times earnings. But there's a reason behind that because people don't believe those earnings are going to continue. Um, also, timing the market, very, very common. Uh, mistake is really really hard to do um, like one of the best times to buy a few years ago was I think uh, March the 3rd that was the very bottom of the market very very few people knew that uh, it is really really hard to time markets to decide that's the best point or time a stock to say that's the lowest you can get lucky but I wouldn't rely on it um, and the longer you wait for something to become cheaper, you can be wrong and it can get more expensive and then you buy it and you feel a lot of regret and anger um, and you're also missing out on all of the dividends. If you're out of the market for a year, you could have got hundreds and hundreds of pounds in dividends, but you were just insisting that it's going to be lower and you also miss out on any recovery. It's better to be in the market generally there's a it's time in the market not timing the market that's a general rule to follow and dollar cost averaging works if you're buying uh, index funds or a stock consistently over time so you sometimes you buy it when it's too high sometimes you buy it when it's too low so you get a decent average price that gives you good returns and though it dollar cost averaging prevents you getting huge returns and it prevents you getting really really bad returns if you do it for long enough and people also overestimate the abilities of analysts and forecasters um, you should always bear in mind that in general more buy recommendations are put out than sell recommendations so there is a bias in um, the opinions of analysts and forecasting is extremely difficult and unreliable. You often see like broker forecasts for two, three years out on a stock, which I don't put any weight on. I see them as very unreliable. I once seen some analysts um, forecasts on a reinsurance company. I went, well, if you can predict that, you think you can predict anything because that is a business in which completely random events wipe out profits completely and that guy decided nothing random or unexpected is going to happen in the next two years hence I can predict these profits are going to go up by this amount which I don't believe for a moment
uh, ignoring randomness, just like that person that thought he could protect free insurance profits. Um, strange and unpredictable things happen all the time. Markets occasionally behave very, very strangely. You make assumptions and then it goes completely the opposite way. The The great phrase is uh, black swans. When you look at swans, you see all of them are white. Every swan is white. Everyone you have ever seen is a white swan. And then some black swan appears in Australia, some small colony of them, and they go, actually, there's black swans, so our assumption was wrong. That's why you need to consider randomness. And always be humble. So you always have to be uncertain. You say, I'm pretty confident um, that I'm right about this, but I could still be wrong. So you're always factoring in that risk. People don't say I'm 87% right about this, or I believe 27% in this, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, people tend to think more absolute. They say it's not, or it is black and white, which is not how markets work. Uh, and getting mixed up in derivatives. This is the last point I'm going to make. These things are very, very complicated. They don't belong in the vast majority of people's portfolios. I often see adverts from brokers uh, pumping these sort of derivative type investments to average investors. I don't believe that uh, average investors should have any involvement in uh, dividends. Perhaps you could consider some of the sort of more insurance, say, kind of defensive uh, um, derivatives, but I would not be making bets. I told you it's very difficult to predict markets. There's a whole host of problems facing the people who buy derivatives. And sorry, but uh, you want to leave that to the experts, people like Lehman Brothers. They had a hell of a lot of derivatives and it didn't do them any favours at all. And these were very, very smart people. Uh, it would be very nice to think that Lehman Brothers was a group of idiots, but it absolutely wasn't. And it was derivatives that were a big part of Lehman Brothers' problems. So I don't know how these average investors are going to do better. Uh, because they are very risky. Lehman Brothers found that out the hard way and a lot of investors find that out the hard way. Um, things like contracts for difference, options and uh, spread betting are all best avoided. And also you can lose more than you can invest. You have to understand that and realize that you can lose your entire investment and then get a bill afterwards with certain types of derivatives. That's not a very good way to invest, knowing that you can lose everything, you get no income. If, if you're wrong, you don't get any dividends or sort of income. And you can lose all of your investment and then your broker will send you a bill. I don't know how people can get involved in that. The worst of the worst, in my opinion, I hate these with a passion. They are so awful. Things called binary options. If you ever hear someone talk about binary options, ignore them and it will save you so much trouble. Just completely ignore any talk about binary options. Don't click on any ads to do with it. They are the worst thing you could possibly put your money in. I hate them. Alright, so hopefully they, these uh, tips that I've given you and some heads up on some of the worst investments will prevent you from the biggest mistakes and whatever you do, stay away from those binary options.